Hello and welcome to part two of our series on Tekken 7 Basics. Our intro section in part one provided a good foundation so we won't waste a lot of time on this intro, but I would like to remind you that the written version of this guide is already completed, so if you're looking for more information and don't want to wait for the next videos, take a look at the video description below to find a link to that. I've also once again included a link to the Tekken Glossary and Jargon List in case you need to reference that at any point. Now on with the show. We've covered enough that we can now talk a little about general Tekken movement. This is movement that essentially all characters share in some fashion. Keep in mind that we are only going to go so deep here. There are technical character statuses we can talk about, but those are best left for more advanced guides. First, jumping. To jump, simply hold any of the upward directions. Typically, you are considered airborne nine frames after starting your jump, meaning that during those initial nine frames, lows and low hitting moves may still hit you. In other words, it does take time for your character to actually go airborne, even after you've inputted the jump on your controller. Note that this only applies to a raw jump. There are many attacks and manual movement techniques that go airborne in fewer than nine frames. Crouching, as mentioned in part one, is the exact opposite. As soon as you press a downward direction, the game will put you in a crouching status the very next frame possible. The word possible here is key. There are some moves that may only allow you to go into crouch by pressing a certain direction. For example, you can only go into crouch by pressing down and not down back, etc. There are also moves that have built-in options to recover faster only if you go into crouch. Normally these are moves with downward strike animations. Frame data is useful here to identify these moves since it will show you the crouching status. In addition, to state the obvious, if your character is still recovering, you may hold a downward direction but the game will not put you in a crouch until you finish recovering, unless the move itself ends its recovering crouch. Keep in mind as well that you are not necessarily considered to be in full crouch as soon as you press a downward direction, so you cannot do full crouch moves immediately. We'll expand on this in a later video. It's also worth mentioning quickly that crouching shrinks your character's hurtboxes, so this can help you evade moves even if they should otherwise hit you ducking, like a mid for example. In contrast to jumping and crouching, backdashing, which is executed by double tapping back, is not a change in your character's state, but rather a technique designed to quickly move your character's position. It's helpful to think of a Tekken stage as a grid. Backdashing and forward dashing is a way to move your position on the grid backward or forward. Holding back can accomplish this as well, but a backdash is a sudden burst of backwards movement that occurs much quicker and moves much farther than simply holding back. Backdashing is a key spacing technique that allows you to move swiftly away from a dangerous position or out of the way of an oncoming attack. You can also link together backdashes, referred to as backdash canceling, for even more movement flexibility, which we'll discuss here very shortly. Lastly, keep in mind that you can block attacks while backdashing by simply holding the second back input or by shifting to down back if you want to block low. But if you try doing anything else, there will be a window during which you can be hit. Note that the distance a character moves in a single backdash will vary from character to character. So don't be surprised if you notice a difference in efficacy from one character's backdash to another's. Forward dashing, as you might expect, is the reverse of backdashing with a couple of notable situational changes. First, you can cancel a forward dash by pressing back or down back, but unlike a backdash, you cannot block while you're forward dashing, so there is more commitment with a forward dash. You can also string together forward dashes, although the inputs are a bit different and you're absolutely leaving yourself open to attacks when you do that. Again, we'll discuss this in a later section. Finally, let's dive into sidestepping and sidewalking. This is a 3D game and the developers have been careful to create moves that have at least some built-in linearity. So sidestepping and sidewalking are very powerful. To begin, we must always keep a couple things in mind. First, the difference between a sidestep and a sidewalk is subtle but important. A sidestep has a defined distance that it will travel, so once it's done, you'll stop moving. 
A sidewalk typically doesn't move quite as far initially, but it can keep going forever. This allows you to get out of the way of additional hits that might actually track you and potentially gives you bigger rewards if you can get to your opponent's back. The second thing to note is that, like a backdash, the distance a sidestep or sidewalk will initially travel varies from character to character. Furthermore, it's not always true that a sidestep travels farther than a sidewalk or vice versa. For instance, Alyssa has the best sidewalk in the game and it easily outmatches her sidestep. Zafina, on the other hand, has the best sidestep in the game and it all is almost always better to use than her sidewalk. We'll discuss throughout these videos how to place sidesteps and sidewalks, but understand that with the exception of homing moves, which of course are designed to track in all directions, the vast majority of moves can be stepped in some fashion. Creating whiffs is incredibly important in a fighting game, so focus on using sidestep and sidewalk to get those opportunities for yourself. One last note, don't feel bad about getting hit out of your sidewalk or sidestep. It happens. Choosing to sidestep or sidewalk is a commitment to some degree, so even if you're just starting out, have faith and confidence that it'll work. Over time, your brain will naturally identify good situations based on past experience. And of course, that advice is certainly not limited to just sidestep and sidewalk. So we're going to take a moment here to talk about something important, backdash canceling. This is a more advanced movement technique, but not only is it one you should eventually learn, but it's so common that we would be remiss not to discuss it in a beginner's guide. Simply put, backdash canceling is when you cancel a backdash and then immediately do another. This allows you to quickly chain backdashes together in order to create space and hopefully opportunities to punish your opponent. When done properly, you should be able to block the majority of the time during your cancels. There are a few different ways to accomplish backdash cancel. We will give you two here, the most common two. The first is the most optimal, referred to as Korean backdash or KBD. The notation is back back, down back, neutral back. The down back here cancels the backdash and buffers a back input for you. So when you shift to back again, it will register as another back back. You must not wait on neutral for too long, otherwise you will not get the buffer. When done correctly, you are only vulnerable for a frame or two. You can link backdashes this way as many times as you like. Just keep in mind that you need only tap back back once to get the chain going. It may help to think of it as a triangle that you are doing over and over again. Now the second way is a shortcut method. Back back, quarter circle back, back, repeat. With this method, it's important to know that it is still fast, but has more vulnerable openings. The down back back interaction is also not as clean, so you're far less likely to get random crouching blocks, which happens a lot when you do the Korean back dash. Also, this is not possible to do with characters that have a quarter circle back sway, since you'll get the sway instead of another back dash. So Paul, Brian, etc. Still, it's a common method as it's a far easier, more natural motion to do for many players. Regardless which method you use, start slowly and make sure you can do a singular iteration properly, then build up speed. Now that we've gone over movement a little bit, let's discuss ways to deal with aggression. If you're a new player, you'll notice almost immediately that you are having a tough time dealing with constant attacks. You can't block forever, otherwise it's only a matter of time before your opponent breaks your defense. So what do you do? One thing that you can do is attempt to counter hit your opponent. In Tekken, if you manage to hit your opponent while they are attacking, i.e. during the startup window of their attack, it will register as a counter hit. The effects of a counter hit vary greatly between moves, so it's important that you experiment or research your character's move list to see which moves will get you the most reward for a counter hit. The next step is figuring out where to place these moves, which is certainly easier said than done. Much of this will boil down to practice and experience. It's also helpful to return to the idea of frames. If you are in a situation where you recover before your opponent does, you can use that extra time to beat your opponent to the punch, literally. 
but perhaps you've been in a situation where the frames didn't work out. Perhaps you had advantage and yet your follow-up still lost to a slower move. Why? Part of the answer involves the crush system. Only specific moves have this property. It is not universal. There are currently two kinds of crushes, high crushes and low crushes. If a move crushes, it cannot be hit by whatever it is crushing. A crouch jab, as an example, high crushes, as do most toe kicks. There are, however, a few things to keep in mind about crushes. First, crushes take time to activate. Much like how we discussed jumping in the previous video, the vast majority of crushes are not instant. For example, a hop kick does not start crushing until several frames into its startup animation. Noctis's while running 1 plus 2, on the other hand, crushes lows after only 3 frames of startup. Second, and somewhat obvious, the crush system doesn't last forever. Once the window is over, you're no longer immune to the previously crushed move. Third, just because you crush something doesn't mean you automatically win the situation. There's no guarantee that your crush move will actually land. In some cases, you might both whiff, but your opponent will end up recovering before you do. Lastly, evasion does not equate to a crush. This is a common misconception even among veteran players. There are many, many moves in Tekken that have evasive properties of some sort. Part of the beauty of Tekken is that evasion isn't always consistent. A move that tends to evade highs may still get hit by a high in certain situations or if the high has a particularly large hitbox. This cannot happen with a crush. Side note, special mids that can be low parried are often also considered lows for the purposes of crushing. Now, power crushes serve a similar role, but rather than avoiding a move through some kind of evasion, power crushes have armor. Just like a regular crush, it takes several frames for this armor to activate. All PCs operate in a similar manner. They will armor through all mids and highs during the armor window. They will not armor through lows, and grabs that connect during your armor cannot be broken by you. Again, like crushes, each character has their own unique PC, so specific characteristics on block and hit will depend on the character. You might also notice that there are moves that do not crush or even evade, but still tend to win in unusual situations. For example, Magic 4 is a term used to refer to a standing 4 high kick that launches on counter hit. Many, though not all, characters have a version of this move. Magic 4s are designed to beat jabs and jab-like moves. Even when you are at disadvantage, a Magic 4 can often beat a jab. Does that mean they always win? Of course not, but it does mean that it will win in situations where other moves of the same speed or faster might lose. Why does this happen? Recall our brief overview of hitboxes and hurtboxes. While watching that video, you may have asked yourself how consistent hitboxes and hurtboxes are. We touched on this a little as it should be obvious that hitboxes will vary drastically between different attacks, but the same applies to hurtboxes. As you move your character around, their hurtboxes are shifting along with the movement. But as we quickly mentioned, an attack can alter your hurtboxes. As you would expect, the fewer or smaller your character's hurtboxes, the harder it is to be hit. But even a shifting of your hurtboxes can be favorable. In the case of Magic 4, the attack's hitboxes cover some of the character's hurtboxes. As a result, a jab has a tough time reaching deep enough, and because you are kicking back at the same time, there's the added benefit of a potential counter hit. Now, Magic 4 is by no means an outlier here. In fact, there is a special category of moves that are quaintly referred to as panic moves, or panic buttons. These moves are not necessarily identified as such in the game, rather they are moves that players have identified as being useful in rough situations. Crush moves can certainly fall into this category, but any move that can help you evade or counter a handful of aggressive options at once can be a panic move. Magic 4 we've already covered. Steve's back 1 works in a very similar way as Magic 4. A hop kick is a good example of a panic move that crushes lows. Paul's down 1 plus 2 is a fun example of a move that doesn't really evade or crush, but can act almost like both at times. 
Now, before we end, we should briefly return to the topic of evasion. You can think of evasion as a crush light. As mentioned earlier, evasive moves don't adhere to any particular X beats Y kind of rule, so they don't always win, but they have a high probability of evading under certain circumstances. However, we should point out that there are many setups that take advantage of evasion. These setups are designed to work the vast majority of the time. For example, Josie's switch two on block sets up a hop kick that will almost always beat a jab, even though it's not a high crush. All this is to say that you don't have to always be blocking, ducking, etc. You can use moves as a form of active defense. The reward for doing so can be counter hits and or launches, so you may find that you're getting more in return than you would through static defense. Thanks for watching part two. I think we've given you enough to chew on for now. Again, we hope you enjoyed it and hope it was helpful if you're a newer player. As mentioned previously, reminder that the full written guide is already completed and you can find the link in the description below. We still have several videos left to go. However, you can obviously use the written guide to jump ahead if you don't wish to wait until the remaining videos are finished. That being said, we hope you'll give the video a like and subscribe to the channel. I also do as much streaming as I possibly can, so you can find my Twitch link below as well. I also have links to Twitter and Facebook. If you really like the channel content, please also consider supporting us on Patreon. That's the absolute best way to support your favorite content creators. With that, we will see you all for part three. Have a good day and stay safe.